tell me a little bit about the, the terraces, what they have in common, and maybe what's a little bit different about each one. In the Cahor region, we have four terraces. The first terrace is the floodplain really beside the river. There, the grapes give a very high production, but of a low quality wine. We have no vines on that level at all. We start on the second terrace, where there's, it's much more sandy, well-drained, so we've got a lot of nutrients there. And that gives a wine more, a more fruity wine. Then when we come to the third terrace, we start finding um, red clay, purple clay. So that shows that there's a certain mineral presence, notably iron ore. So we have, on the third terrace, much more complex tannins. When we move to the fourth, we're really on the coast, the, the rocks. Here we have big iron ore deposits. So we get a more rounded, velvety taste from the grapes. The tannins are much more luxurious. There's actually quite an extensive competitive history here, is there not? Yes. Um, Cahor is one of the oldest winemaking regions in France. And in the first century AD, um, the emperor Diomitian ordered that all the grapes in this region should be pulled out and replanted with grain because there was a famine. Uh, really, it was because the Roman winemakers were jealous that the French were making better wine. Right, OK. So he's trying to eliminate his competition, take, yeah. away, take away your tools, basically. Yes. Now, you have actually created a wine, or at least Jean-Luc Baldus has created a wine that is based on that story, right? Yes. Um, in 1976, um, Jean-Luc's father released the first um, Grand Cru in the area. And he named it after Prince Probus, who was the Roman emperor that ordered the replanting of vines in this region. And that Probus wine is a blend of this tier. This tier and the third terrace and the second terrace. When we blend them together, we take the best from each. This terrace brings, as I said, the, the velvety tannins. Mm -hmm. And you add that to the complexity of the third terrace, which helps with the laying down of the wine. And with the second terrace, you've got the fruitiness, so you end up with a, the blend of a, a, a perfect wine. Right. It's the best of the, really, the three terraces in one. And you're actually harvesting today, right? Yes. Okay, I think we should go have a look and make sure they're working hard. They should be. What's your decision-making process? It's a complicated process based on the ripeness of the grape and the weather forecast. For the grape, we look at, first of all, the bloom, and then we taste it to see if there's the right acidity balance, sugar, and tannins. And then we have to look at the weather to see if we're going to have the right amount of sun or rain, and that can change everything. Do you want to have a look at the bunch? OK. Take a few right here. Thank you. What's the first thing that you're looking for? The bloom shows uh, the ripeness, the blue dust, if dust. you like. Dust, okay. And then underneath you see the colour of the grape. It's a mm -hmm. nice deep colour. Mm -hmm. The skin is very clear. So that it's a consistent, sort of rich colour? And then from that also you can tell the juice yep. inside. Nice plump. Mm -hmm. And then we Definitely. taste it. The fun part? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And now what are you looking for? On tasting them, you can get in the juice the, the sugar and the acidity balance, mm -hmm. and you bite through the pips to see if the tannins are ready, not mm -hmm. too green, not too astringent. The pips being the seeds. the seeds. And they are actually not bitter, because not at other bitter. times of year they, they are. They're yeah, quite they're, green. They're very green. And what about the skin? Should it be crisp? Should it be soft? It should be crisp. Uh, it should pop in your mouth okay. virtually, yes. Okay. Now, what factors are you trying to keep in mind with the weather at this point in your harvest? Well, really, we're looking for sunny weather. Rain at this point would be more difficult for us because we're, we're at the point where we're looking for the op optimum ripeness. A dryness for the picking, too much water is bad and also can lead to problems with mildew and other 
sicknesses that can come from the damp weather. And too much water can actually almost drown out the sugar? Too much water when we're harvesting would then go into the fermentation. It would cause problems. You've also decided that you're going to pick in the afternoon. What difference does that make as compared to early in the morning? Early in the morning, in certain cases, there's a small cover of fog and therefore humidity. Isn't it beautiful? It's beautiful when we see it from high, but for picking for certain wines, you want to eliminate too much humidity. If you were to pick earlier in the morning when it's colder, what would happen to the final blend? What would happen is that there's certainly more moisture on the grapes. We end up with a kind of condensation and that has knock-on effects on the fermentation. Do you use machines? You, you hand harvest everything? We hand harvest a certain part of the, the vineyard for the probus, for the black wine, we, we hand pick because that way we're able to ensure that we are picking the best grapes. Now you mentioned this black wine, which is something that is quite unique in the world, yes. right? So tell me a little bit about that wine. It comes from a middle age recipe because in the 13th century, uh, the Cahors was exported to Britain. It was actually the wine for the marriage of Henry II and Eleanor of Aquitaine. And, but to survive the sea voyage at that time, they had to fortify it. So in the middle ages, they used to take half the harvest and they'd heat it in a cauldron and then they'd mix it together to bring out the sugars and slightly more alcohol. And to keep it and to protect it from the travel. And protect it from the travel. So um, uh, Jean-Luc Valdez, he found the recipe and wanted to marry it with modern vinification methods to make, uh, to, as a, a kind of um, homage to the past, but with definitely a, a modern taste to it. Let's go have a taste. Okay. How would you describe this wine to somebody in terms of flavors and aromas? Aromas, we definitely find the plum, red fruits, black currant, blackberry, very jammy aroma. Mm -hmm. And a little bit of pepper. What would you eat with this? My personal favorite is a bar of good chocolate, 75%. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's specific? Yes. Okay. But it smells like this is a wine that could really stand on its own as well. Yes, it can stand on its own as a, a wine to be drunk. Tutsa. Tutsa. Well, not that I'd complain about having a bar of chocolate either. Okay. <laughs>